Friday. Happy Friday. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's broadcast of Truth, the reality under the headline. Tonight, as always, we have a special guest, Christopher Hoyer, going through the doing the book reading and the review of the book, When That Day Comes, Training for the Fight, edited by the, the great Natalie June Riley. And tonight we're going to be covering chapters 14 and 15. <clears throat> well, hopefully we're going to be able to roll into 15. So chapter 14 is roll with the punches, and then chapter 15, spitting mm-hmm. distance. Oh, so, uh, yeah, man. Yeah. I figured I might be able to throw the spitting distance in tonight. It's, you know, a couple chapter, I mean, a couple page read. So, yeah, be able to go with it. So, before we uh, go any further, you know, how's uh, how the week treats you? Nah, that was good. Um, took a day off yesterday. Had uh, had a really great day yesterday. Just took a little, uh, took a really long walk. Um, oh. All right, Knight Rider. Strike them each other, Michael. <laughs> so, when uh, my eight hundred number, you see this right here. So my 800 yeah. number, when it, re- when it rings in because of it being anonymous, right. it rings in. So I, it's like me dealing with like suicide prevention and everything else. I actually have to take the call. It's one of the ones where I can't uh, shuffle off. But anyway, yeah. Sorry gotcha. about that. Yeah, no worries. Guys. No worries. Yeah, I did. Took a nice long walk yesterday. Did some shopping. Uh, came back home. Took a nice long nap. Hung out with the girl for a while. Um that was good. It was really good. So now the weekend's rolled around. So now it's back at it and see what kind of mischief I can create this weekend. So, mm-hmm. Thanks, sir. <laughs> any more leniency on running your program the way that you know you no. see fit? <laughs> Not even close. No, it, it was just insane. I mean, I know we kind of laugh, joke about and everything like that, man. But it's you know, again, even even. In law enforcement, you know, we kind of make the, I, mean, I, I hate using the word fucking joke. It's really not a joke, but, you know, it's like, hey, look, you hired me to do this. You know, let me do this. You know, I mean, yeah. don't question me unless there's like something that's like out in left field that I shouldn't be doing, you know, so. Well, I mean, my whole goal, and it's no secret that I want to do is to save lives. You know, I mean, that's if I can teach somebody something, even if it's you know, something they don't agree with, it at least gives them a starting point. Say, hey, you know, this guy's full of shit, or, yeah, I'm going to take that on board, but I'm going to add my own thing to it, or whatever else. And I love that, you know. So, uh, but, yeah, whatever. Over my pay grade, so. Ish. Ish, yeah. <laughs> we all have somebody to answer to, right, so. Ish. Yeah. <laughs> I got one over here. She's staring at me right now, so. Yeah, she's got to, she's got to, uh, She's got that mentality. She I was, I was keep, already keeps, keeps you in line, though. It's I was already instructed. No talking about work on the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how does that happen though? When you know that's what this is, really. That and if I, 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 I guess what she's trying to say is for me to stop asking you how your week went. Nah, <laughs> it's, it's you know, she's sick of hearing me bitch about it. So I guess that's fair, you know. And because she's the only one I get to talk about this kind of shit, you know. So. I, I like the new modeling job you got going on, though, bro. Right. Oh, yeah, right. Nice little uh, modeling, modeling gig. <laughs> no, it's not just from the eyes up, right? So uh-huh. that was my design, believe me, I'm going to tell you. So. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Uh, how's, how's Matt doing? She's fantastic. She loves her new job. She's uh, What new job? I did actually finish reading her book yesterday, even though I got beat up for it. Not sooner, but, you know. Um, now nah, she's fantastic. We've got a whole bunch of stuff coming up. All kinds of book signings and traveling and all kinds of cool stuff so um living the dream man living the dream so are you guys doing the duality or um a few things we are yeah there's a big show coming up in um coronado in a couple of weeks i think uh, end of april or something like that um so it's going to be a, a dual book signing it's like a blue not it's kind of sounds a little a little left field it's more of a flower show um but it's also a uh, book signing kind of a thing as well so totally awesome you know i mean it's that's the thing though too is you know knowing those demographics and being able to draw the crowd you know i mean if you can implant yourself in a venue that you know so many individuals are there that's just like with quaker state 
you know, it's a, you know, restaurant, but they always have these car shows and things like that, that frequent, but it draws in the masses and it's, you know, the perfect time to where, you know, they also have it where like adopting pets, you know, endangered animals and things like that, you know, they'll come out there and set up their little booths because there's so many different masses that come out there and, you know, the crowds roll through because, you know, once somebody walks through and sees the cars, the next crowd comes in and it's just sitting or circling around and things like that. So you get, you know, it's not the same individual. It's not like if a hundred people show up, you know, you can only show a hundred people, you know, what it is that you have. Hey, look, here, here's an autograph book. You've got another hundred that's rolling in there and everything too. So, yeah. well, she's uh, speaking on those terms. She's also doing the uh, women's expo in Phoenix here pretty soon. Which show off. Is ingenious. Yeah, I know. Right. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that just inspires me to think about it too. It's like, Oh, we got, you know, the, I didn't make it to SHOT Show this year, um, but all those kinds of things, you know, they've got to have the, the Hunter's Expo or just whatever, all the, all the boy stuff, so I can start jumping in on those as well. So, Well, you know, that's that's actually a, a pretty good little gig, really, when you think about it, because, mm-hmm. you know, hunting, you know, knowing what you, you still have to have the same mentality and preparing yourself for that as well, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it, it may seem a little unorthodox or kind of out there, but... You know, what's that have to do with that? But you know, anytime somebody's handling a firearm, what you pro- provide somebody for and prepare someone for, you know, it's <laughs> personal on all lines. So, yeah, I got a, I got a really good buddy of mine that was on our, our SAU SWAT team. And uh, I was doing a shadow with him one time. And he was supposed to be on a hunting trip someplace and whatever. And for whatever reason, it got canceled or, or I don't even know the story behind the whole thing, but either uh, whatever way, the way it happened is, uh, the dude shows up and all the guys are like, Hey, I thought you're supposed to be hunting. He's like, Oh, I got my Phoenix tag too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You did not just say that, man. Unbelievable. So yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you gotta, you gotta know the guy to appreciate his sense of humor, you know? So but. yeah, it's kind of, uh, I kind of got my little depressive state, man, where, cause I had so many different things with business that came up that I didn't make the symposium March 10th and 11th. Hmm, right, that right. was, I mean, I was talking about it for months, had my tickets, you know, $175 for, you know, the whole show, da, 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 da. and then just so many different things with the, the medical businesses and things like that just bore me down. Couldn't do it, huh? I'm saying, yeah, it was insane. It's like, ah. yeah, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. how'd that go again? Ah. <laughs> exactly, I know. Uh, yeah, so we're taking full advantage of, uh, you know, make sure we try to hit all the ones that we can. Uh, as you well know, just to spread the word more than anything, you know. Uh, but yeah, and, so yeah. well, I mean, l- let me know, like the bookings that you have, because I mean, I'm, I'm about to, like, launch launch your website number one, and then that way, you know, any kind of upcoming shows, people will be able to, you know, if there's tickets that need to be ordered, people can order directly from your website and things like that. You know, because you'll have access to it, so you can actually go in there, and if you wanted to attach a PayPal or anything else like that to it, to where individuals can actually just, you know, pay you directly from the website, they can do that, whether it be for, you know, scheduling different shows, or, you know, individuals can actually order your book. You know, do you, do you have boxes at home, or is everything strictly on Amazon? No. You have boxes, I've, right? I've got probably another 300 at home here. Okay. I'll take an order many times. Plus, a lot of people don't realize, also, it's on Audible. Um which luckily is not me talking, so. Um, and, and luckily, I was overlooked for the reading of viewers uh, or that's. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you get the you get the Dunkin' Donuts guy to do a, do a cop book, man. How can you say hey, no? that's uh, yes? Yeah, right. You know the, the irony in its best. <laughs> so yeah, um, but yeah, so we got all that, and um, pretty much every time we travel, we either have the book shipped directly to where we're going, or we just load them up ourselves and. Uh, if we can drive, clearly we're going to do it that way. So like Vegas and Phoenix, stuff like that, we can drive too. And um, you guys have all the table coverings and all that good shit, right? Yeah, we were just in Arizona two weekends ago, and I had a we actually hung it on the back of the, the awning, just my uh, my big sign, um, which is super cool because I had a lot of people stopping just reading that, you know, and then they're like, oh, okay, great, and then they leave. All right, whatever. So the read along, ride along. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's what it says. So. Um, which is cool. I mean, that's a huge compliment to me because you know, I, I never thought it was going to turn into something like it is, which is just awesome. So, but uh, yeah, because I, I want to get something scheduled on because I'm getting all the funds put together and things like that too. Because I'd, I'd really love to have you know a specific like travel 
gig set up to where like you, Mike Zanito, you know, because he's got the Peacekeepers for Life and he, he has the uh, the Pauls and stuff like that as well, too. His different programs and maybe even like Michael Segrew, if he's, you know, in for I know he yeah. stays pretty busy, but I kind of like to get to, you know, at least you, Michael, uh, Mike Zanito, to kind of get some things going on to where we can get some different uh, shows scheduled and things like that. I'll get the different hosting uh, facilities and venues to be able to get you in there for book signings and then do like, you know, do some speaking as well. Yeah, that'd be great, man. I'm, uh, we've got doing a OTOA and then, um, I mean, there's a couple things coming up in San Diego here. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that I just can't even keep track of. I've got the Sniper Fest in Phoenix next month. Sniper um, Fest? Yeah, it's a, I'm not sure if it's every year. It's part of the uh, ATOA, but I'm not sure how much they're actually doing, but it's all obviously all SWAT guys. So they want me to come in and talk about um, clearly some of the tactics that I used on our on our little mess over there, but then how I survived it after the fact, of course. It's not going to be the full-blown presentation that I normally do because it's it doesn't really follow those same lines. So I, got- I love that ring, man. It's awesome. Michael Knight. Oh yeah, I know. I can see he's a little, you know, a little swoosh going across the front of his car. So, you know, you you look back and that's what I love about like movies. That's like with Gene Roddenberry and like Star Trek and all that good stuff. Oh, yeah. man. It's like uh, you know, how far ahead of their time they were. You know, it's like that's like you know, Kit. Yeah, you know, we had talking cars before freaking we even had pagers. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. My phone's acting up too. I don't know what's going on with my phone. Whatever. Uh, you let me know when you're ready, man. I think. Uh, all right, I got the got the same thing going on here. So you can you can do it without the spectacles today, man. Oh, I'm just, unless I crank up the the highlights, man. I got to have something better I can see with. So, but that's another beautiful thing about this book as well, too, is the the size of the print. Yeah, the right. Font and I mean, well, the font and everything is part, it's perfect. You know, it's made for good reading. Well, thank it God. Gives you little things for notes and stuff like that, too. Yeah, she knows her stuff, so it made it really easy, you know. And um, it makes it because, I mean, I've got several books here that, I mean, are super awesome, great reads, but I mean, the freaking print is so small, you're, you're like, what? I can't even can't even see it. It just makes it much more difficult to, to get into, you know. So, well, I mean, and also on another note, you know, that's why I really love to see kind of, you know, you and Nat doing the whole book tour together because, I mean, they, they go hand in hand. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. literally. I mean, so, you know, it'd be kind of nice to have you both there. Like, hey, here's the other counterpart, you know, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff, man. Pretty excited. So, um, who knew? So. All right. So, we think? You're rock and roll. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Now, that, now that we're – uh. Glitch free, yeah, exactly. All right. Knock on wood. <laughs> <Not too. laughs> All right, so number uh, chapter 14, roll punches. All right, so over the years, I have learned that adrenaline is a wonderful thing, even a tool from time to time. However, it cannot be relied upon. In the academy, we conducted three minute drills, exercises designed to test your ability to stay in the fight. First, you're tested in the big ring by yourself, and then once again, uh, against three opponents. Three minutes sounds it sounded easy. I remember thinking <laughs> it'll be a breeze. Ha. In a fight, three minutes is an eternity. In this case, of course, I'm talking about a closely observed event by experienced trainers in a controlled environment. As recruits, we were expected to be in top physical shape, although that was not always the case. Fast forward to the street. Assuming you work for a big agency, you will likely have to pl- have uh, plenty of backup at any given time. What if your closest unit is 30 minutes away? Uh, there are a couple of different schools of thought here. Uh, if you're working for a city agency, you may have more t- you may have more help. However, do not be fooled into thinking it will save your life. Assuming the call is heard, officers are available and they arrive safely. It could and likely will be more will be three minutes at a minimum. It can also be a whole lot longer. So how do you handle this? Uh, fit- fitness is certainly one way. I'd rather lose a fight because my opponent was superior to me in martial arts versus I gassed out too, too quickly. Of course, it does not matter because losing it all is, in my opinion, unacceptable. Hey, so I want to I want to kind of touch base on number one right here too, because it's kind of because there's a lot of individuals don't realize how many factors 
go into that, you know, because a, you have dispatch, you know, how readily I'm like, that's why like, you know, with dispatch being so overlooked a lot of times to where, you know, if they come in, they're just not in the mood or, you know, so many other different things. If like, they're still boggled by the last call that they had, you know, wondering the, the what ifs, the what ifs and things like that. And they delay a little bit, you know, the delay a little bit, you know, doesn't always necessarily affect who you're responding to, you know, a lot, if you are in, you know, need of backup and things like that too, it may affect, you know, you actually taking that call, you know, and then fatigue from, if you just came off of, you know, your last call, your last incident was something to where, you know, you had foot pursuit or whatever the case was, or you had physical altercations being bogged down. There, there's so many different unknown factors and, you know, the beginning of this chapter, you know, it's spoken beautifully about the aspect of the controlled environment, you know, and that's just like when you see individuals, when you, when it's time for, you know, when you're PT and you have, you're pairing up, you know, the vast majority, you, you try to pair up with someone that has, you know, your frame, your stature and kind of to where it's, it's fair, let's just say. Yeah. But in the real world, you know, when it's like, Hey, I'm a hundred 160 pounds wet and wearing boots and you're going up against somebody that's 240, you know, that controlled environment is non-existent at that time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's all those factors that go into there to where, you know, being ready and is, Hey, do I even get out of my car until backup gets here? Okay. Well, if I don't get out of my car until backup gets here, you know, how's it going to affect, you know, the innocent bystanders that are out here or the victims that are, you know, the, that made the call. Right. You know, so there's so many different things that, may seem out of sight, out of mind, and everybody else, again, questioning, well, Officer Hoyer, why weren't you here sooner? Officer Hoyer, why did you wait? Officer Hoyer, why did you ask me quest backup? Officer Hoyer, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the blah, blah, blah that goes on, you know, so. Well, it was uh, it was strange when I was going through the academy, which is kind of weird. I never even thought about this. So he just brought it up that uh, the guy that I went against for, because he do the, uh, it wasn't three-minute drills, but basically you get on your knees, uh, to make it fair, if you will, for everybody. And you do push-ups for a solid minute. And you just go as hard as you can. Um, and then you just box with another guy. All right. And the guy they put me up against was some big old freaking 220-pound dude. Luckily for me, the guy had never been in a fight, so he didn't know how to fight. Um, and so we're going at it. And I just tried to freaking wail on the guy. And the short of it was basically came in. He overpowered me and got me kind of in a in a doubled-over headlock, if you will. He basically reached up and <laughs> the back of my neck and pulled me down. And so I just found myself, and I'm just freaking rabbit punching the guy in the gut, and they end up stopping the fight because I was just, I mean, I'm freaking beating the crap out of this poor guy. You know, it's like, well, this is how I'm going to fight in real life. I'm going to I'm gonna fight dirty to make sure I go home, you know. And, um, I think he learned a very valuable lesson from that, that, hey, a little 140-pound kid is going to kick the shit out of you if you, don't, if you don't pay attention. Grabbing onto him is a great defense, but if he still got, has arms free or whatever else, he can still do some serious damage. Yeah, I think we both took something pretty well away from that one, you know, so. Well, on, on top of that, too, a lot of individuals don't realize, because, you know, a lot of people have never had a physical altercation. Hmm. You know, I grew up boxing, you know, and it's like you have individuals with mentality like, oh, I can go run three miles and not even be winded. It's like, but, you know, you had three minutes in a boxing ring to where, you know, and during training, they try to do the controlled breathing to where, you know, you're breathing out of your nose because you've got mouthpiece in, mouths closed and things like that. So the breathing's a little bit more difficult. But in the same sense, three minutes, like you said, it's, it is eternity. It's, it's like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> fall down or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it does. I mean, it takes away the, I mean, I don't care how much endurance somebody claims to have and things like that. It's always going to wear you down. Yeah, it's, you know, it doesn't sound like a big challenge. And even in a controlled environment, you know, it, you know, I, I don't max out any higher than 30% when I'm training with guys. Um, but even let's say you go to 50% and you're going at it and you're going at it. And then you realize that, man, this is really, this is really rough. Then you get out there on the street and then you're going at hundred percent. That three minutes, dude, is like, holy shit. I had no idea how hard this was, you know? And I mean, I, I, I'm, hard pressed to say how much training that takes to be able to stay in a fight that long, because I, I can never do it. I mean, I, I try to put my guy down as quickly as I cut as I possibly could, but there are times when I'm getting gas in the middle of a fight and I just have to take a step back and I'm like, Oh my God, you know? And I mean, I'm not, 
I'm not proud of it, but I'm not ashamed to say either, but, you know, cause I was never, never a boxer, never MMA, never a ground fighter, but I knew enough skills to be able to take care of business. But, um, that's a freaking, that's a long time to be in a fight. Well, that, well, that's, that's where the not fighting fair becomes the advantage as well too, where you can actually put a thumb in the eye or a thumb in the throat. And, you know what I mean? Where that, you know, sometimes it actually can make that three minutes seem bearable at times, you know? When I get to the, uh, the story about the, uh, the carne asada, not the, not the food truck one, but there's another one where I basically it's and any, any fighter in the world will tell you, you control the head, control the body. And that's exactly what I did. And it ended up being awesome. <laughs> it was awesome, but Holy cow. That's what I had to do. And when I wrote that report and I told my guys all the time, it's like, man, when you write your reports, they've got to be articulate. And because you made it in court and if you, you know, you wrote all these really shitty reports over here, but you wrote this one really good. Um, that's not going to count because they're going to say, well, yeah, you wrote this one good because you knew your ass was on the line, but you obviously didn't take the time to write them over here that worth of shit. So you only write them when they're important, but you don't over here. So, I mean, that can just go bad for you. Um, when I wrote that report, dude, it was, it was long. It was hardcore. So here I'm mute, man. No, I'm saying, I mean, because I, I know, you know, at least firsthand too, like with reports, you know, a lot of officers just, take it for what it is and they, they just bare minimum basically. But, you know, they don't know how important that comes to where, you know, you work so hard to apprehend a suspect and then come time for court because of your report. Now some fucking clown walks free just because you didn't want to take the time to do a solid report. You know, yeah. Ray Bashir's actually has a course on, you know, the going to the court and making sure that the reports and things like that are done. And like, it's, it's so overlooked where, you can take an incident that was clean and slam dunk and because of how the report was filed. Now you got some fucking ass clown, you know, walking free to do something again, all because, right. you know, we didn't want to take the time to fill the report out. Right. Yeah. And that's a, that's a whole two day conversation in itself about how you need to uh, articulate. And I, I pointed out in my class all the time about the, the little keywords, like, you know, the shall will may can all that kind of stuff. And those are the ones that are going to trip you up all the time. You know, and little stuff like, you know, less lethal or less than lethal, you know, and if you're not paying attention to those little keywords, man, those, they will come back to bite you in the ass, man. I've seen it happen. Luckily, I've been lucky. Uh, most of the time in court, I've had guys try to beat me up and I'm like, nah, you sure you want to go down that path? Because, okay. You know, and anybody that's watching this that knows me will tell you right now that um, when I actually did get around to writing reports, I was actually pretty good at it, but I hated writing reports. I did. I just I sucked at it. I was great at catching but I just, once I catch them, I lost interest, man. I'm not going to lie, but, you know, that's just the way it was. So, but there were times when I had no choice. I'm like, all right, sit down, um, shut off the ADD, and get in there and focus on what I need to do, you know, so. Here in about 10 years, we'll have fucking stenographers riding around with us to write the reports in real time, real action. Yeah. <laughs> Probably would be a bad idea, really. Like, hey, man. Oh, yeah. well, we this for me. <laughs> it's still, well, it wasn't uh, – I don't remember when they, they went away from it, but we had a, what's called PACE. Um, I think it was a police automated computer entry, whatever else. But it's literally a secretary that would just type your reports in for you. Call them on the phone. That's what I got. And she would just type it in for you. And that's how I, I did every single report I ever did that way, only because, you know, partially from laziness, because I didn't want to do it myself. Also, because it was really good to have somebody with some experience to tell you, Hey, maybe you want to try to word it like this, even though they're told not to do that. They're like, no, you just dictate the reports as they as they write them. Um, but when you're new and you don't know any better, it's it's great to have somebody on your side going, hey, uh, I've read this report before. Maybe you want to try going this direction, you know, or whatever else. And just add the little little tidbits. Well, well, on top of that, it's kind of like like with this show right now, how it has the the closed captioning auto generated. The same thing with body cams, you know, to where you know here in the future. You know, that, that is how it is going to increase policing. You know, technology, you know, it can kind of go against and it kind of with so many different people having their phones, everything else, too. It makes it the job a little bit more difficult. But, you know, if here in the near future, distant future, even, you know, our body cameras, you know, if it's able to, you know, because obviously it tells a story. But in the same sense, it doesn't catch in it doesn't catch what else is going on or what happened to prior or, you know, anything else in there. But to have. You know, someone that can, not necessarily a stenographer, but in the same sense, you know, that play-by-play, -play, that'll help justify that report. And that way, as you're writing your report, 
being able to go back and rely on because a lot of times, you know, we we're in the moment. You know, that's why, like, I don't care what kind of training an individual may have. You know, every situation is going to make what you would do different and how right. you respond. And a lot of times we see ourselves and we think that we did. A, you and I have had a conversation the other week about that to where, you know, you swore that he didn't troll until this happened. But it's like, oh, maybe I did troll. Right. You know, but you know that, that camera can actually help, you know, as you're writing that report. That way you don't look like a, you know, again, lose a case when it comes time for court because of the fact that you state one thing, then all of a sudden, you know, defense is playing the body camera footage and it's like, you know, contradicts the first half of your report. So, yeah, yeah, that's tough. I was fortunate to never have to carry one, uh, but I could definitely see how, you know, you could, you could contradict yourself on some level where you, you remember this and then you go back and watch the camera. Now, how do you, how do you bridge that gap though? How do you say, this is how I remember it, but this is what really happened. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's confusing to me, man. I, I, I'm, I'm just glad I never had to do it, but you know, so. Absolutely. Anyway. All right. You ready for All right. Let me try to pick up where I left off here. So, okay. So number two, then there are the outlying agencies uh, and altogether different category because they're usually, uh, they usually aren't equipped to off the same rapid response time as a metropolitan city. A little more cunning is necessary, not to mention more ammunition. Uh, this is a good time to get creative, tactically speaking, because you may be on your own for some time before help arrives. For instance, verbal judo can be an effective tactic, using your words to de-escalate a situation. You might consider unconventional weapons, policy meeting type weapons. However, let's face it, desperate times call for desperate measures. Would you rather take the suspension or risk imminent death? Sadly, in this profession, uh, that's a question you may have to ask yourself. The muzzle, of my, the muzzle of my rifle worked uh, quite well for these for occasions such as these. If all else fails, consider your escape routes, which, by the way, do not make you a coward so long as you get back into the fight at the appropriate time. Running away and leaving your comrades behind? Yeah, that's not okay. How about running away to gain an advantage over three or more opponents? I'd say that's quite acceptable. Facing a dedicated adversary can prove deadly and can happen quick, quite quickly, too. That rings true for any or virtually any scenario on the street. But why a lot... Why not at least have a tangible advantage? When I put, my, put on my public speaking events, I always ask my audience if they've ever been punched in the face on the street. Out of a crowd of about 20 or 30 people, I usually get one or two hands in the air. Time to train, I say. More than likely, getting clocked in the face will not kill you, but it can and probably will stun you. Having this happen for the first time when you're up against a bad guy is not the time to be schooled on the art of taking a punch. I can hear the arguments now, and that's good. Yes, bring them. I know what you're thinking. Uh, no one will ever uh, get close enough to strike you in the face, right? I say good luck with that. Just remember, you're on the street and there are no rules and anything can happen. So practice those defensive t- defensive tactics often. Uh, this topic brings to mind a great time, great line from the movie Roadhouse, a favorite of mine. Patrick Swayze's character says, those who go looking for trouble are not using much of a problem for someone who's ready for them. Be ready, folks. If you take that punch, let it fuel you. Plan it out in advance. Play it repeatedly in your mind. I mentioned the advantage of adrenaline earlier. Adrenaline is, is great, but it will not always be enough. I've always thought that if the bad guy had enough courage or stupidity to punch a cop in the face, he or she needs to be prepared for payback. Not that I was punched in the face a lot, but it did happen, and I can promise you the bad guy got his. When this happens, let your bad guy know that they have screwed up. I always counterattack with major force, being careful not to do serious damage. However, there are those times when your temper will get the best of you. And in that case, remember this, no cuffs, no rules-ish. After your assailant is down or the handcuffs are applied, the fight is over. Uh, You see my point. Uh, You want to give this individual a reason to pause uh, so that the next time he he or she is confrontational with the police, they think how many teeth they lost or how many days they spent recovering in the hospital or in one case, how it sucks to never be able to throw a ball again because of the bite of a canine story for later. And yes, sadly, there are some ladies who get into scraps with cops too. Sorry, ladies. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. We'll keep going. Yes, sir. Well, you know, one, one of the things I do want to touch base on, you know, kind of going back to the the verbal judo. You know, it's a it's a tactic that's been around forever, you know, in de-escalation and everything else, too. But and I know a lot of agencies frown upon drawing sidearm to de-escalated situation you know it's supposed to be 
not last resort, but, you know, kind of at that last resort, you know, and especially with media today and how officers are so hesitant now to actually even have their hand by their firearm because they don't want people thinking, oh, you're doing this because of this, that or the other, you know what I mean? But, you know, the, the barrel of a gun will fucking pause somebody quickly, <laughs> you right. know, but ish, sometimes, you know, sometimes you'll have those ones that are, you know, trying to taunt you even after you draw a sidearm. You muted yourself again. <laughs> Was I muted the whole time? No, just that last. Oh, last the last part. Oh, okay. But no, I mean, the, the barrel of the gun will kind of, you know, mute somebody. Just as I was yeah. just muted. Maybe that's yeah. why it muted, it muted itself. Like, yeah, that's what it does. Okay. <laughs> it's funny but, because uh, I found more guys, I mean, far more afraid of the taser because they know I'll tase them. They know I won't shoot them. <laughs> you know I mean, it's, it's hilarious. It's like, dude. I, I'm more, much more afraid of a gun because I'm probably not going to survive that taser, though. They know it hurts and they don't want to be tased. Man. So it's kind of entertaining on some level. But, uh, well, it's, but yeah. that, it's that free fall drop, too. I mean, I've seen some people get fucked up off the, the taser. Oh, dude. I mean, literally, I mean, just like you're just locked up in a fa face plant, especially yeah. if they're running that way <laughs> and you get that back shot, you know. But it's <laughs> yeah, I've got some great taser stories, man. But unfortunately, um, I think mine failed probably more times than it worked. Well, it's, and that's another thing, too, that, you know, pisses me off about, you know, just as, like, every officer has to be subdued to the arsenal. You know, if, in order for me to be able to utilize my pepper spray, my taser, I, too, am going to be hit with that just so that I know how to overcome and, you know, react in those moments. You know what I mean? But a lot of people don't understand that, A, I mean, I know they have the ones now, but they're few and far between that have the two charges. A lot of civilian, the civilian sector doesn't understand that, you know, unless those two prongs hit and actually make contact, that that taser is rendered useless. And on yeah. top of that, you only have one charge. So if that one charge, you know, subdues suspect for, you know, however long or you catch them good, especially, you know, wintertime's horrible. You know, when people are wearing the big heavy coats and things like that, you have to pray that them prongs even make it to to make contact. Yeah. You know, it's rendered useless. Why didn't you draw your taser? It's, you know, <laughs> try to hit a polar bear with it. You know what I mean? Or yeah. there's just so many different real life situations that the civilian sector is never informed about. It's just, oh, hey, this officer drew their sidearm rather than drawing, you know, taser. Well, it's fucking all I could do. You know, would you yeah. want to see me, me bash somebody's face with my, my baton? <laughs> That's why I got to bring back to more cattle prod batons. I told, I think I told you that before. This is my favorite. What? <laughs> <laughs> Movie uh, Casino, my favorite scene, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome stuff. But I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. I mean, I am. I I'm. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not a fan of the taser, but when it does work, it works. Um, but it's almost almost has to be borderline ideal conditions, you know. Um, now there have been multiple times that we've had guys on the ground and still fighting with a dude. We, you know, shoot him in the back with a taser and then take it down, put it behind his calf, and dude, that's it's game over. I mean, I, you you can't fight that. That's that's just awesome. So you know, uh, you know how many moments have happened to where you know how the tough guy always wants to tear his shirt off. It's like okay, perfect. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Um, perfect scenario. <laughs> yeah, my my food truck started with Scotty. I mean. <coughs> dude and he was getting as much of the of the zap as uh as a bad guy was and you know after you know four or five seconds the guy just launched and that was pretty much game over i mean yeah if scott because was able to hold on to him long enough yeah we could have made something happen but he finally just he succumbed too he's like all right we're done <laughs> so <laughs> all right now what you know so but uh all right let's move on here let me see if i can change my tactics slightly based on my request so <laughs> All right, let's see if I can try it this way. All right, so where was it? You want to give this individual a reason to pause? Uh, I think good for the goose, good for the gander. Is that where we're mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, at the end of that paragraph, do you want to give this individual a reason to pause? Right at the end of that paragraph right there, you'll see that the uh, there were three statements you always offered. Yes. Yeah, there were three statements that I always offered before the quote-unquote beating time of uh, or time permitting and other factors being equal, please stop. Stop it now. I'm not telling you again. <laughs> Strikes are thrown. 
I always preferred the uh, forearm to the temple method. It was a real attention getter. Uh, there were things I enjoyed about proving my point, like watching a guy's eyeballs bounce from side to side like uh, pinballs against his, the walls of his skull. I always knew I had made my point when this happened, um, which was usually great because after they'd come to, I'd often receive an apology or the question, why'd you have to hit me with a Louisville slugger? You know, it's like, dude, I, I tried I tried to warn you, but... Um, I even I mean, said, please, motherfucker. <laughs> I, dude, I did, man. It was always the same thing. You know, please don't make me do this to you because it's going to hurt and I'm going home no matter what happens. Um, but that's just the way it is. Bad guys want to challenge you. And when they realize that they made a mistake, it's like, well, you know, I, I tried to talk you out of it as many ways as I could. You didn't want to play. So guess what? Um, you know, here it is. So. Okay. So uh, um, let me see. How many chances did I give you? Keep in mind, uh, once the chase is over uh, and the beating stops, uh, stop. You won. The bad guy's likely going to the hospital or to jail or both. You won. When that happened, I always took the first step in making amends. Uh, it went something like, hey, man, sorry for the beatdown, but you understand why I did it, right? Um, sometimes they would agree, but more often than not, it was get out of my face, asshole, response. Um, but you know, that can actually well, – I'm sorry about that. I'm going to cut you off. Yeah. But that's actually a, a, a great point that you know a lot of officers really need to keep in mind. I mean, because a lot of times, because we're drawn to that situation to have to happen the way that it did, especially after, hey, please stop, stop, I'm not going to tell you again, and you have to have the altercation, you know, a lot of times we're already aggravated that it had to escalate to the situation of what it did. But, you know, if we do take that time after, you know, subject is detained, you know, they're in cuffs, they're in zip ties, whatever the case may be, and they're subdued, you know, having that conversation with them sometimes will go a long way. You know, John right. Hall, you know, we had a conversation about that to where, you know, a few weeks later, the guy that he you know, detained actually thanked him for the conversation that he had down to, going down to the station. Yeah, you know, right. that, hey, it didn't have to be where it was. I mean, they'll think twice because then they'll start telling you that, oh, I have a lot of stuff going on. You know, I'm trying to get my kid back. I didn't want to have the situation. You know, you'll actually hear their story and they'll have somebody to talk to. And it will be more beneficial in the long run for both sides. You know, at least you'll understand you know, why they didn't listen to the first three fucking warnings. You know, but then also, you know, they'll understand why, hey, look, maybe I should have thought it through before. You know, <laughs> now, now I got to go get teeth implants. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, sometimes you got to be really cautious about that. Because I've had it where I've, you know, I get done with a, with a scrap, whatever else, get the guy back to the station, trying not to by any means not kiss any ass but i'll be like hey man you know let me get you a coke or a snickers bar or whatever else give it to them sometimes they want to talk but they think if they're really nice to you you're going to start dropping charges on them <laughs> no, that's not what we're doing here i mean you're still getting charged with all these all these things but as long as we can kind of discommunicate i still have to do what i got to do i mean i'm not going to let you walk because you kick me in the face it just doesn't happen that way you know so you're still getting you're still getting booked into jail um a buddy of mine actually he had to take you know time off with with pay, but that's same situation. It got into a physical altercation, took him down to the station, chatted up with him, bought him from fucking you know a, a cold water, you know, got him some snacks. Didn't write a ticket. Mm -hmm. Let the subject go. The fucking subject sued because he got his brain speed in, and they the argument was the fact that well if I did anything wrong, where's my ticket? Yeah, and right. it, it was a big, ugly situation. It's, it, it's just, you know, it can go like you just said. It can fucking go either way. You know, they, they do yeah. have that in mind. Like, well, I'll talk you out of this ticket. Well, I mean, that's that's a really easy one to. I mean, depending on circumstances, that's pretty easy to, to make go away. It's like, hey, we got discretion. You know, I I could have done this, but because of my faith in humanity, whatever else, I went ahead and cut you loose. <laughs> I figured, and I had this. Um, I had a very similar situation happen. We we got this uh, biker guy. And I had to write a, a statement to the judge because I didn't want my name on the on the citation for this particular situation. And, you know, the judge asked me flat out, he's a, he goes, well, why are you trying to back out of tickets now? I said, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't have this uh, inkling to do this citation. This was from somebody else, one of the investigators that thought we needed to do this for probable cause on the stop. OK, well, we didn't we didn't make any references to the, to the actual traffic stops. I really had nothing to do with it. I said, the fact of the matter is, the guy, we, we took his bike, we took his gun, we took his phone, took all of his stuff, 
Um, he's going for like four felonies. I think that's enough. Where you know we write this guy tickets too. It's just putting more nails in the coffin. I just don't think it's necessary. And he's like, okay, you know. And truth be told, I just didn't want to have my name against the freaking, but against a particular club. But right, that's a story. I think I, I may have wrote that story. Yeah. I'm not sure. We'll talk about it. So touched on it. Yeah. So, but I don't want to give away too much. It was a breeze. <laughs> yeah. Well, luckily it turned out to be. But even still, man, I was. I've already had enough bad juju coming back my direction and i that was one that i definitely did not want to have so um luckily i got i got out of it pretty much unscathed but so <laughs> all right where are we at here uh da, 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 where are we at here um when that happened when that happened i always took no nope, i thought i already read that one so uh, so I think it was also, it's a, yeah, uh, I, I keep doing that. I did that the last time. So I, I always give you like the paragraph we just read right. instead of the one we're on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, get out of my face, asshole. So that's not to you, by the way. I'm just saying, <laughs> oh, sorry. uh, okay. So I'll, I'll also, after I dusted off and escort to the car, I would be as gentle as possible without jeopardizing my safety or theirs. I would let them, uh, see that too. It was all about timing. I never, ever, ever lost control of them. But I also showed that I can be compassionate uh, and that I was not always out just for blood. Uh, actually, never out for blood. But um, once every blue moon, yeah, <laughs> hey, you, you, it's not personal until it becomes personal, right? And then after that, mm. all right, so once every blue moon, a subject would try and exploit my kindness. Uh, they mistook my, they mistook it for weakness and they always paid dearly for it. But usually it went in my favor. Uh, with each contact I made, I reminded myself that it was not personal. Until it was, but that's for another chapter. Uh, being nice, particularly when I needed information from the bad guy, I would usually offer a Coke, candy bar, whatever we had on hand. Uh, he would be amazed at the transformation when treating a bad guy with respect, at the very least with a perception of respect. It was huge. So long and short of it is, uh, of it all, stay in shape. The importance of physical fitness is not limited to just working the street. I've seen it time and time again on both sides of the fence. It also leaves the street for a desk losing all desire and or motivation to stay in shape because it's no longer quote unquote necessary or required per department standards. Hey man, that's your prerogative. However, let's just say you're driving home from your desk job and you see a fellow officer in a scuffle on the side of the road. Of course you will stop and help them. Uh, then you just might realize that uh, this is a fight of a lifetime. Damn it. Should have kept up on that cardio. I've seen cops drive away from these types of situations. I've also seen them sit back and watch as a physical fight goes down, having done nothing to assist. It might seem far-fetched, but it does happen. Wait, you saw me fighting this guy, and you didn't stop to help? Why again? I'm sorry, but in that case, you do not pass go. You do not collect $200. And, oh, yes, turn in your badge right fucking now. Unacceptable. Um, I had a situation exactly like that where I had two internal affairs guys um, show up on a call, and I went out by myself in this alley. Uh, just turned out I happened to be right there, came around the corner, and they already had this guy under surveillance for whatever reason. Um, and I go out with the guy, fights on, calling for help. And as I'm scuffling on the ground, I look up and I see their car and they're pulling out and they take off going the other direction. <laughs> I'm like, and I just, it was just one of those situations where I just happened to recognize the car that they were driving for whatever side note reason that it was. And I see myself, so, um, you guys see me in a fight in an alley by myself with some freaking shut and you're just going to drive off. Are you, are you kidding me? So I never did find out who the guys were, but I didn't know who, what, um, what, um, detail they were with, but you know, it is what it is. Like, okay. I, I know a situation that happened with an agency like that to where it was actually their CI that, you know, they were, that's the reason why they were monitoring. It was their CI. And then he ran into an altercation with another jurisdiction that they were trying to apprehend him and it became a scuffle and things like that. Well, they didn't respond. They took off and they just left their CI there and things like that. And it just, it was an ugly situation oh, yeah. because the, all the officer from the other jurisdiction that was actually having the altercation with the sus suspect actually put the officer in the hospital. And that officer is now on a desk job. He can't even patrol anymore. It, it, it was a real, real, real bad situation. So, well, I'll tell you what, man, speaking of that, I know for a fact, I don't know who they are. Um, why I treated everybody, you know, with respect and dignity until, you know, until it was obviously that they were not what I thought they were. Um, I know for a fact I've booked undercover cops before, you know, what, what that means is you don't ever know who you're dealing with, man. Right. So, 
you want to do something stupid, man, you better make sure that, you know, you're, you're covered. Even if you are, that's still, you're, you're compromising your integrity. It's just not worth it, man. I think they clear out of the system. So it doesn't even ring back. You know what I mean? And, the, oh, yeah. and that's one of the things too, that CODIS, I mean, which, you know, deep cover sometimes you never know. Beyond the Law is a great movie. Charlie Sheen, by the way, 1992, 93, or something like that. That's a great movie about. I it's love a, that movie. It's I just a, watched it the other day. A, a lot of people never even heard of it, man, but it's a great movie. It's based on a true story. Oh, I know. I you know, know, but it's like, I mean, he, he went like deep cover. And a lot of people don't realize, like, when, when stuff like that happens and you're completely erasing the system to where, you know, it's a, nobody will know that, that you're attached to an agency and stuff like that. I mean, it's. Again, civilian sector never understand like the realities that you know some have to face and things in that situation and stuff. But yeah, that's what's well, wrong. They wanted me to go undercover right right from the start. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to do it, man. They're, you know, they just love my my look. And I said, yeah, no. Um, I just wasn't. Well, yeah. I, well, I mean, one of know. the things with the other two, I mean, you, fuck, you worked the streets for like 18 years, man. It was like, I mean, you're like perfect candidate. You're like candidate number one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, I mean, I, I know firsthand, I mean, that stuff gets, it gets pretty, you know, because then you get inside your own head because you got to, you know, what role are you playing? You know, are you playing street or are you playing, you know, cop? And it gets, and you have nobody to talk to about it, you know, because it's, you, you, you know, and you want to talk about some fucking PTSI. It's the, who the fuck am I going to talk to about this deep cover operative to where I have to maintain my integrity with, you know, who, who I'm surveilling. Yeah. And still maintain my integrity with you know the agency in which you know I'm performing these duties for, and it gets fucking. Yeah. I well, can't even imagine this fucking. I did I did enough undercover work, which was actually a lot of fun, depending on the sort of circumstances. But I I just could never get comfortable. I mean, I was actually really good at it. I just could never get comfortable doing it. I mean, I was I was born to be a street cop. That was what I did. I was a genius. Um, but it was kind of scary because first things first, when you're when you're truly undercover, you're living two lives. You know, you got your home life and then you got your street life. You know? and, the, and the home life is what, like, really kind of people never understand, you know, it's because you ultimately can't even tell who you're with, what you do, because right. you'll jeopardize them and your other immediate family. It's, it's fucking ugly, man. Well, I got <laughs> one of my closest buddies, man. He was a drug enforcement guy and he looked apart big time. You know, he drove the freaking uh, the Monte Carlo with the hydros and everything else on it. And they live in a pretty exclusive neighborhood, you know, and all the neighbors are always like, he, lo he looks like a straight up freaking Cholo. You know, he did. It was awesome. Great. I mean, genius undercover, but he goes home, takes his kids to school or the PTA meetings, whatever else. And they're like, okay. And then once he got done with that, he cleaned up. Then he can finally confess what he did all these years. They're like, oh, we had no idea. You know, you can't, you can't reveal that stuff. And that's, that's very difficult to do, man, to, to survive a lifestyle like that. So. Yeah. And then, you know, on top of that, too, you know, a lot of individuals don't understand, you know, how long it takes sometimes to build a case against somebody, especially if it's a large organization or a large group that, you know, you have to work your way up the ladder and things like that. And it's fucking years. Some people spend it seems like a lifetime in it. You know, it's like how many fucking people do I got to be? You know, it's you know, well, I was just uh, why don't you just arrest the fucker? <laughs> You wish you could. Uh, I was just um, so I give these updated book things all the time, you know, bestsellers and whatever else. And I just saw Jay Dobbins' book came out again. Of course, it's been out for a while, but that's a that's a hell of a story too. But um, that's that's one of those fifty fifty stories where a lot of guys think that he was kind of playing both sides. And um, but regardless, I mean, you you freaking go undercover with the with the biker gang like that, and you got freaking brass, man. That's that's, that's why I love the. I mean, Beyond the Law was pretty. That was pretty much the same, same movie. Movie. Yeah, it's great. I, I Another one of that. my favorites is uh, The Departed. Oh, I love that one too. That's yeah, that's classic. You know, um, all that kind of stuff. And you know, I, I watch those and I think, how close would I come to being that guy? And I'm just yeah, no, nah, nah, just no thanks. That just wasn't for me, man. I was too too busy wanting to be out there chasing bad guys, you know. So well, you know, I mean, that, that, that just that's your story, though. You know, I mean, you knew what you were the whole time, you know, up until even to the point to where you knew that, Hey, look, you know what? It's time for me to leave this portion of it, go into what it is that you're doing now, you know, writing the book, you know, you providing the different classes and things like that. You know, you've known those things, you've known your limits and you've known, you know, where you felt that you were going to be best for service. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's it's a phenomenal story and things like that. And I commend you for you know what you continue to do and things. So it's well decisions. Yeah, you thanks. Know. All right, what do you think? One more? Yes, sir. Spinning right. distance. Yo, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is, uh, this is entertaining for sure. So, all right. Uh, it was just another day, a normal day on patrol. Um, I was minding my own business when, for no reason at all, I decided to drive through a random parking lot, one that I did not normally drive through. This tactic of unpredictability is a good habit to get into. Uh, do not get routine oriented, not even in your daily driving. Bad guys do notice. Think about it. It's 1747 hours, and the bad guy says to himself, Hey, that pain in the ass cop should be rolling by any second now. You see any potential danger here? So I was driving through the parking lot when I heard the old familiar cry, officer, officer, that guy just trashed my store. Was he a customer? I asked. No. What happened? I don't know. He walked in and started breaking stuff. I've never seen him here before. Hang on. Let me put on my superhero cape. Um, Bean bags, yeah. Uh, I believe he's he's asking that question in regard to when we were talking about the tasers, about the, yeah, yeah, the big yeah. heavy coats and everything too. But you know, again, that's one of the things too that you know not every officer is armed with the bean bags. Right, you know, yeah. Some agencies, especially like the smaller cities or municipalities, you know, that's only for their their SWAT or their tactical teams and things like that that actually have the bean bags, which is kind of crazy yeah. actually. But that's how we started off with our tasers. Only SWAT guys had them, and then they now everybody's got them. And- I don't even remember the last time I heard of anybody getting tased, but uh, they are they are fun when they work. But all right, so uh, yeah, hang on, let me put on my Superman hero cape or superhero cape. So I jumped into the Crown Vic and I drove toward the street. Of course, it was one way, and the subject was walking the opposite direction. Uh, excuse me, sir. I called up. Yeah, that's not going to work. Hmm. I guess I better try something new. Hey, man, come here. No, uh, you don't. You do know that the cops have to chase you to bring an ass kicking with them, right? Quote. Uh, Chris Rock, so <laughs> one of my favorites. So, um, when I caught up to the suspect, I wound up, wound up having to use physical force because he spat at me. That's not okay. Besides people shooting at me, being spat at was my number one pet peeve on patrol. Still, I learned a lesson that day, as you will read. A backup officer is on her way. Um, Cuss around the suspect and questioning had begun. Uh, it was not going very well since I was the one asking the questions, and he was... The one uh, gave me the same response over and over. Something defective. Fuck you. That's not very nice. Oh, well. Uh, My backup arrived and I warned her that he was a spitter and that she should keep her distance. And in all fairness, I had also warned a suspect on more than one occasion of the consequences of his actions. No one likes a spitter. (laughs) I'm not kidding, man. Um, You spit at me or shoot at me, uh, you're, you're going down. That's just it, man. Those are the two things that will get you put down quicker than anything else. So. Well, on top of that, too, that, you know, it's kind of like with a sucker punch. It's kind of like, you know, at first, like sucker punches don't hurt as bad as like knowing the punch is coming. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's the same thing with like being spit on. It's the it, it, process that at first it's like, this motherfucker really just spit on it's me. Completely <laughs> un, unpredictable. You, you, you can't even tell it's coming. And by the time you figure it out, it's already too late. And by the time they figure it out, they're on their back and getting thumped. So, or on this guy's case, on his face. But, um okay so however he did not heed my warnings in fact he tried to hit me at least three more times um when the suspect and i uh saw the backup officer exit her patrol car things went sideways fast and as i mentioned i had my pet peeves while on patrol uh so down he went face first no hands to brace his fall uh into the corner of the curb i felt bad for about one second yeah that had to have sucked sorry man well kind of um christopher He's not moving, my backup exclaimed. Oh, man, I think he's dead. Hey, man, you okay? I asked, nudging him. Shit. I rolled fire and called the boss. The guy was out for about 45 seconds. For me, that seemed like a long time. By the time the next wave of folks arrived, he was awake, groggy, and bloody, but very much awake uh, and suddenly very, very nice. I'm sorry I tried to spit on you, ma'am, he said, and you too, sir. I didn't mean it. Um, This was first and maybe last for both me and my backup. Clean him up and go to the hospital before you take pictures. And, of course, book him, my boss barked. And see me in my office. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, that dude, uh, <laughs> he uh, he got jacked up, man. I'm not going to lie. That was that was, ugly. that was one of the most um, damaging to my career that I've done for somebody that didn't die. I mean, he was, he was messed up pretty bad because um, I did. I put him down with everything I had 
straight to his face and he caught the curb with the side of his face. And um, I know I knocked out all the teeth on the left side. I ripped off his ear over here, had a big old yeah. freaking strawberry down the side of his face. Um, kind of hard to clean this up, boss. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'll take the picture as is. Yeah. Make, 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 make you pose like some of them uh, stars do. Like, this is my good side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not so much. I don't think this guy had a good side after that. Um, you know, luckily, he uh, when he went down, he was face down. And so um, his teeth pretty much just fell out into his mouth. And then when he came to, he just started spitting teeth out on the sidewalk. And I was like, oh, shit. Well, that's pretty cool. But again, man. And then I found out later on that the guy was uh, – he was hep C. So – it's like, yeah. And now that I can, I didn't know that then, of course, but now that I know what some of these guys are carrying around, I can say, hey, man, look, based on my training experience and stuff I've, I've seen out there on the street, this is what could happen. And when you've been warned several times and you still try to do that, I'm not going to apologize for fucking knocking your teeth out. Man. I'm just not. Yeah, just and you knew what you were doing. You knew exactly what was going on. You saw me coming. Um, and you still tried to act in a stupid way and you and you lost big time. Do I feel bad about dumping you on your face when you couldn't control the, the fall. Yeah, like I said, for about a second, yeah, because I know that I had to suck, man. You see it coming, like, oh, down you go. But, hey, man, you had a choice. You didn't have to do that. So, but. Well, you know, it goes a long way, though, too. I mean, because that's, that's why, like, you know, a lot of them actually put it as, like, the attempt to murder aspect of it. I mean, it's assault. You know, people are like, oh, it's just spit. It's, it's not just spit. I mean, that's – I mean, so many different contaminants, bacteria, it, it just – it's nasty. I, I, I'm not going to say I'd rather get pissed on, but being spit on is like one of the, like, it's, I, I can't even talk about that. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I had another guy do that to me one time. And uh, this guy claimed that there was a guy in a brand new Mustang that, um, that backed into his car at a stoplight when clearly the guy ran into the back of this, of this brand new Mustang. He's like, yeah, man, no, do this thing in reverse and then ran my truck. <laughs> you mean your 78 fucking Chevy pickup? This guy rammed your, your truck? Yeah, no. So anyways, he got booked for a DUI. Um, but on the way down to the hospital, because he's claiming a back injury and whatever else, I'm like, okay, whatever. So I cleared him. I'm going to take him to the hospital. And on the way down there, he's spitting all over the back of my screen in my car. I'm like, dude, you know, and I had warned the guy clearly multiple times. I'd actually called ahead to uh, security at the hospital, down at county hospital. I said, hey, man, I got a guy. He's kind of violent. Um, just based on spitting, which I consider violent, you know, and uh, because this is years later after the first incident, and then uh, so I get him down there, and I had I had warned the guy, I said, Hey man, just do me a favor, just control yourself. And so I waited, so I had all my guys surrounding me, all this, all the uh, security officers there, or whatever else, open the door, and sure enough, man, right in the face, wow, oh, uh, dude, he got pulled out of the car, oh, freaking dude, I picked him up and just body slammed him right on. <laughs> And all the guys are like, holy shit, dude, you okay? And I'm like, oh, man, come on. You know what? That's again, that's one of those things where you just you just don't do that, man. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that I'll that I'll tolerate. You call my mom a bad name or whatever. Okay, yeah, I get it. But you do that kind of shit, man. That's that's when I say it's not personal, it becomes personal. That for me is that's just not okay. But I'm, I'm gonna have to ask John Hall if that's why he uh because he makes all those masks and stuff like that. He's got like a Jason Voorhees mask. You know, had to start I wonder if he's got a a spitter mask in his uh, patrol car. Like a little he does. fucking uh, he Hannibal Lecter mask. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome, man. Yeah. So. Well, I know he rides around with his uh, Michael Myers mask frequently. Does he really? Oh, my God. I got, <laughs> dude, I got to get a picture of that. That's too funny. Yeah, full uniform. This Michael Myers mask. <laughs> uh, Imagine getting pulled over by old Michael Myers. Like, <laughs> no. no, I cannot. No, I cannot. He seems like a scary enough guy as it is, man. I want to be freaking <laughs> with that mask on too. So. Uh, so. But uh, hey, this week I'm, I'm I'm hoping to have it this week because I'm trying to have a big group discussion this week, a big roundtable. You, I want to try to find what they be best for uh, Chris G, yeah. and then uh, Jason Hardy, Chad uh, Mulberg, Ray Bashirs, John. Uh, if um, David Lee, Dr. Paul Henning, uh, A.K. Duzani, Krista Fee, Phoenix, 
something about about the time I get about ten. Yeah. For this week, I just want to find out what day and time is going to be best for everybody. But uh, what day is best for you? Um, I know evenings are best, really. But if if I could get it like Wednesday till fr- like Wednesday through Friday, I, I might do it if I can get it on the weekends, which might be you know more suitable for everybody. Mike Zanito. So yeah. So. Yeah, I can uh, I can latch on to a handful of guys too, probably if you want me to. Um... Yeah, cause I, I can have because on this broadcast, because of the platform I use, I can have up to ten, including myself. You know you. So you know the email I sent out was for yourself, John Hall, Michael Sugru, uh, Mike Zanito, Ray Bashirs, David Lee, Jason Harney, Krista Fee, A.K. Dizani, and uh, Chad Malmberg. Had to check uh, Chad Malmberg. And then yeah. Dr. Paul Henning. So that's 11. And then, oh, I'm sorry, Chris Moore. Chris Moore as well. So there's 12. So I'm going to have to do an extension or, you know, kind of find out who's all going to be on there, split up into two shows. But yeah. have a big round table going on about everything with the PTSI, different tactical trainings, de-escalation, and have a big round table meeting and things like that. Have you spoken, though, uh, Jason? About the biography and stuff, Jason Harney? Yeah, I did once. We kind of traded uh, information. Um, sent him a copy of the book. I am waiting to hear back to see what he thinks about it. And Because that biography he just did, uh, Wrist Lock. Just, yep. I, I think it's getting ready to get released. That's the one that has actually you know, raised in that one. But uh, he had the one in blue and stuff like that. So I'm pretty I don't, I don't think he's working on one right now. Might be a good time to kind of yeah, okay. lock him down. I'm hoping that he uh, he jumps on board and says, "Yeah, it's it's something that sounds like a good project." Or um, if he's not interested, it sounds like to somebody that he thinks that will want to take it on board. You know, um, of course, the problem is that Natalie's already got her book getting ready to get lined up for her movie too. And I'm like, "Damn, you <laughs> already jumping on board, man! You're freaking taking over! Holy shit!" So, which is awesome. I mean, I, I couldn't be more proud of her. But um, I guess I think uh, Michael Michael Segru's book. Is uh, the relentless courage is coming out here really soon too with uh, uh Dr. Uh, Shauna Springer. Shauna Springer, yeah, yeah, I saw that. So, yeah, I sent him uh, oh shit, it's probably been a year and a half ago. I sent him a copy of mine and <laughs> pain in the ass. He's like, Well, I'm not going to read yours till I'm done with mine because I don't want to get any uh, <laughs> <laughs> any idea. Well, I'll t- I tell you one thing he did do, man, he went and got that uh, that forward by uh. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dave Grossman. I know he did that. Uh, I saw that too. Mm-hmm. I know. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> the sheer, you know. Now he's got a, he's got a phenomenal story too, man. Just loves the oh, game. I already know. Uh, it's a, but it's, I mean, I was I was kind of joking with him, but it. it's like he's he's not willing to read mine because he doesn't want to steal any of my ideas. It's pretty much how it was, which makes perfect sense. And um, plus, he's got his own thing going on. He wanted to focus on his own project and wanted to try to avoid any outside influence, which I completely totally respect. Mine was already done before he's uh, he got too hardcore into his, but now he's got his out and it's just launching, which is just awesome, man. I just love that it's uh, taking off so well, you know. So awesome. So well, I, I write like poetry and quotes and self help stuff and columns and all that stuff too. And it's like people are like, "Well, do you like reading poetry and all this stuff?" I'm like, eh, "Ish," but it's I'm, I'm the same way. It's that I don't I want it to be my way. I don't want to kind of like be a mirror of what somebody else was wanting and things right. like that. So I just like, kind of let my writing just, you know, free form, free flow and all that good stuff. So, yeah. Well, half the stuff I wrote, I just steal from other people. I'm like, yeah, like Patrick Swayze and shit, you know, or whatever. So. <laughs> it is. Sometimes if, if it makes sense, you got to roll with it, you know? I agree. I agree. You know? Um, and you can take one little quote like that and kind of make a whole kind of story out of it, you know, just with that one little quote itself, you know? Well, I mean, comparatively speaking, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really easy for me to, you know, take quotes off of some of my favorite movies or one-liners or whatever else and incorporate any of the real life stuff. Um, based on what I know from over here, I was telling one of my students yesterday about the, uh, the colors, you know, and the, the two, two, two bulls overlooking the herd of gurneys, you know, it's like, eh, and I, I'm not going to tell the whole thing now, of course, but, um, and now how that just correlates directly into the law enforcement community. It's just awesome. You know, hundred uh, percent. and so stuff like that. And I try to, as, as serious as this thing is, I mean, it really is, obviously, but I try to interject some humor in there if I can. 
because I don't want it to be, you know, you fall down on the news after every freaking chapter. Oh my God, no, that's, you know, there are those chapters, obviously we know that. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just the best part of our community. We're just going to have to face on that. So, but, but I mean, the, the beauty of your book though, is, I mean, again, because it's relatable in every sense. I mean, even if in, because very statistically, very few officers experience critical incidents or like experience the the shit magnet lifestyle, <laughs> you know, but in, in essence though, I mean, from the beginning of your decision to go in, you know, drive fast, chase, you know, bad guys, you know, cops and robbers, you know, but you know, up until, you know, your first instance is the, you know, how brass is just like, Hey rookie. I mean, you know, capturing and encapsulating all of that into the book, there's not an officer alive. I don't care if it's in law enforcement, if they're in security, if they're in corrections, if they're in military, it's it's relevant to every fucking body. From the point that we made a decision that, you know what, I'm going to go service this fucking community, how that, my initial thought about how this was going to be so fucking great going in, and then, you know, the little steps that, you know, transpired, you know, built a story of what it is, man. It's, it's phenomenal, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. It's, it's a read along, ride along for real. <laughs> I had no idea it was going to be, I mean, when I started this adventure, you know, how it was going to play out in real life. And then toward the end, of course, how the book was going to impact, you know, my life. And thank God for Natalie. I mean, if it wasn't for her, this thing would probably be still sitting on my laptop. And I'd be still just passing it out to all my friends, you know, who would have never. I mean, I don't want to say never, but um, I don't have, you know, the background or the knowledge to be able to get it to where it is now. And, you know, I owe her all the entire credit for that which is just awesome so um and she did clean it up too i mean there were a few things in there where <laughs> you know because i had it all 100 percent caps like we do with, with cop stuff it was all caps you know whatever else and she's like no nah, she's saving it for the second book yeah well <laughs> actually well she's working full-time but it was, now that her book is done and she really got no excuses so i need to start freaking yeah now she has no time for anybody it's like oh yeah i got my book out now <laughs> <laughs> i'm done editing <laughs> yeah, I'm the writer now. Yeah, we're gonna so, like, <laughs> so like yeah. Tuesday, I have uh, Tony Gonzalez on, you know, and he, you know, he has this book for like the Delta Force and everything else too, to where it isn't his like life story of it, but you know, he made this chase these chase novels about like you know his experience in special forces, military, and all that stuff too. That you know where he can kind of encapsulate you know his story. In a third party, I guess you could say, to where you know he's creating a character, mm-hmm. but yet you know a lot of the similarities of like what he experienced and things like that's actually in there and stuff too. So it's nice. pretty cool. But you know, I mean, your book is like it's up there, but like my my favorite books of all time, War by Sebastian Junger, Thirty Three Strategies of War by Robert Greene, uh, Death Be Not Proud by John Gunther, and then The Alchemist by Pablo. But uh, those are those are my those are my top four, and, and then. Then came when the day comes training for the fight, and it's it's phenomenal, man. I don't Thanks, man. I, I don't speak highly of many books. I mean, because I'm I read a lot, man. I read oh, yeah. a lot, watch a lot of stuff, man. It's not not too many books grab you the way that you know this has, man. Seriously, I appreciate that. Well, I'll tell you the problem with that, and I love it, and I do. I mean, it's it's absolutely an honor that I've even got it in real life. But um, you start sending this thing out, and then this is only I don't know if you can see it. So that's only like the smallest little tiny library of books that I've got from other authors. And I've got an entire drawer full of other books that I haven't read um, that I just keep getting more and more and more of. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got to I got to get all these things because everybody's read mine. But I haven't read any of theirs. I feel like an asshole for that. I'm like, oh, my God. I just Well, Adam Davis has that, uh, that devotional book. I got you know, I bought that one. It's a, you know, 365 devotionals to where, you know, he has the, the scripture in there. And then he has like the real life activities and things like that, that, you know, we in law enforcement can actually, you know, apply that towards our day and things like that, too. And family. So it's it's really, well, it's really, really good, too. So I think he's got another one coming out or some, something coming out. Hmm. So we got, we got to hurry up and get uh, book two launched for you. You hear that, Nat? Yeah. Book's done. It's time for you to start editing the next one. I know. I got to just start sending her a chapter at a time so she can start working on it. But um, she's so busy with her own stuff. Um, if she just teach me how to do it, I can do it myself. But she's like, "Yeah, you're." Well, 
that, that day has came. I'm trained for the fight. That's best book too. Yeah, <laughs> actually, it'll be three because uh, we got the first version now. This one, and then uh, I've actually got the new title already done. It's called uh, "Reinvented." Uh, oh, whatever you're telling me. So it's a it's a compilation of the old stuff plus now where my life is uh, with all my new ventures and so forth and so on. So uh, the chapter she neglected from the first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm always, I shouldn't say always um, for the longest time in the last couple of years or so. Um, I'm always coming up with new chapters and new ideas about stuff that I want to do. And I, I try to put that in there. So <laughs> yeah. See the, see the crying face. Yeah. We live in San Diego. How hard can it be? Right. So, uh, but uh, Alchemist is a great, great book. It's phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal. Is that one? On, uh, I'm horrible about reading. I'm not going to lie. Is that one on Audible? Yes, it is. All right, I'm going to find that one and start looking. I was about to because I finished hers now, yeah. miraculously. Which I, I have to admit, man, I was when I started getting into it. Um, all I could do, I could, I couldn't wait to get on the train and get to start getting to work. And to start reading it on the train, I'd have read the thing in like no time flat. But now that that's done, I got to find something else to do. So, um, and then we got to get you writing one too, man. You got a hell of a story too. So, oh, I got, I have books ready to be, uh, I have manuscripts already. All right. I've been writing for a long, long time. And it's like, so I'm on allpoetry.com. My screen name is just fallen, but it's cool. the, I write, cause I'm, I write columns, I write different, uh, things like that. But, uh, the uh, because I'm the posts I do on the whiteboard. Those are like the the prologues to each chapter. So I have that that I write about in you know, the one little statement that I do and things like that. And it's uh, so I'm I'm ready. I just I need somebody like Natalie to oversee it for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you gotta, what. Got, gotta get it going. Fly on out to San Diego and I'll put it to work for you. So, well, it's the, uh, it'll give me a reason to. Uh, well, my aunt stays out in uh, La Jolla, California. Dude, we're like right down south of. Yeah, it's like south south of San Diego a little bit yep. and things like that. So, well, because my, my uncle Bruce Castetter, he was a prosecutor for the state of California, uh, and then my aunt Carla, she was the dean of Thomas Jefferson School of Law. You know, so it's the we got we got judges and. All that stuff in the family, so you're you're running out of excuses, man. So <laughs> anyway, hey man, it's uh it's kind of almost date night for us, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it off. But man, I know we're trying to hear that, man. I know we're, we're I know. only at a hour and twelve. We still got about tell tell them that we got about forty eight minutes left. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is the I think this is the shortest video you and I have had, ain't it? It's been pretty short. <laughs> I know. It's well, we get over all the freaking humps and stuff, you know. Yeah, but uh, I'll stay in contact with you over the weekend uh, this week. Actually, when I nail down, like when we're actually going to have the round table and everything else, that, that group discussion and stuff. But, you know, more yeah, importantly. Yeah, that was great, man. That was a good time. I like that one. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to bring some more uh, new faces on, too. And then if, because uh, I got to reach out to him, I, I feel horrible. You know, sometimes I get so entranced in like the other businesses and like building all this other stuff and doing demographics for people that I forget to like reach out to somebody. But if you get a chance, reach out to Brandon Griffith and see if he wants to jump on. I haven't okay. had a chance to respond back to him yet. I mean, we were texting for a little while. Then all of a sudden, I got a brain fart or something and forgot to reach back out to him. I I'd love to, to you know, bring so, him yeah. on. Uh, so, but, you know, you and Natalie, go enjoy yourselves. You more than deserve it. And more importantly, man, you guys both stay safe and stay blessed in all things, brother. Hey, man, man. Thanks for the opportunity as always, brother. Always, man. Love you guys. Love you back, brother. Catch up soon, man. Yes, sir. All right. See ya.